You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here with you. We are discussing The Devotion of Suspect X by Keigo Higashino, chapters 8 to 14 this week. And oh my goodness, Herds, we may have made a startling discovery this week while you were reading through this novel. I know. First bit of uh, quote unquote original research for the show, maybe? I was going to say, we, we, we claim to be detectives, you know, in the context of these mysteries, but really we're solving the historical mysteries of when when books were written and when 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 mangas were written and how it all connects together in a big web of Japanese cultural vortexness. Yeah, it's crazy. So last week on the show, you were comparing the structure of this story to Death Note, which yes. from what I know of Death Note, having not actually seen it myself, sounded like a fair comparison. We, it it is it is um so, sort of. But yeah. then. You started reading for this week, chapter eight, and just sent me a frantic message in in yeah. a state of panic. Could you could you tell me a little bit about why you were so yeah. panicked? So here's here's the deal, right? The chapter chapter eight opens up with uh we're at a school or something. I don't know. It doesn't matter where we are, but we open up on our characters arriving at a at a tennis a tennis court. And I was like, why is there tennis in this novel? This is weird. And by the way that the, the characters described as like, you know, both Ishikami and Galileo, like, are like competent, like tennis champions. And there's like, da, 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 all this like nonsense going on. I was reminded in, in a moment of hysteria of a scene from Death Note mm-hmm. in which our cat and mouse characters, the Galileo and Ishikami equivalent, uh, Light and L, trying to get them mixed up have a tennis match. And so they're having this like inner monologue debate thingy where they're trying to figure out whether or not Light is going to throw the match and whether or not the psychopath would throw the match, but whether or not they wouldn't throw the match because not throwing the match would be less suspicious than... It's it's ridiculous. It but, is very ridiculous. Uh, this has led us on a mad goose chase with this this comparison here, these scenes being very, very similar in tone mm-hmm. and, and place in the story, to discover that not only were the original Death Note, the, the manga and light novel written at about the same time uh, as as Devotion of Suspect X, mm-hmm. but that the way that they were serialized uh, t- lines up like pretty perfectly in the in the actual timeline. Yep, I would not be surprised at all if these authors, uh, the the author of Death Note, has never truly been uncovered. He writes under a pen name. Well, that's what I was going to say. Is when you were telling me this, I was I was looking it up and I was kind of looking into Death Note. Found out that. Uh, the tennis scene was released in around 2004 during the middle of the serialization of the original release of mm-hmm. the, the Devotion of Suspect X, though admittedly it was Google translated, so it's entirely possible uh, my facts are a little off here. But but we do know that uh, Sugumi Oba, the yes. uh, Japanese manga writer behind Death Note's real identity is, quote, a closely guarded secret. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So all I'm saying, Hertz, is listen, maybe Keigo Higashino is... Sugumi Oba. I wouldn't be that surprised, honestly. If not the same person, then they definitely know each other, you know? This is against the conventionally stated facts of the Death Note community, as I've researched <laughs> over the past week. But I'm just saying, Herds, listen, if we if we line up the dominoes, getting two stories for the effort of one, this seems just like a sensible business decision. Maybe Keigo Higashino is the man behind Death Note. It's entirely possible. Uh, we'd have to go to his house and ask him. <laughs> uh, I'll be honest, I'm just glad that somehow my interest in, in the Japanese anime has brought you around to, to doing this, like, deep dive into into Death Note. The, the thing that does interest me is that if these stories both were coming out at the same time, to me that says that there was a piece of media that came out before them that may oh, have inspired sure. both of them. And I'm curious to find out what that is. I'm going to try track that down over the next week. Yeah, if not a piece of media, then an event, something in the zeitgeist of culture that has inspired these authors independently. Yeah. So the reason, Herds, that I've let you take us on this massive tangent, though, to open the show today, is that nothing much has happened No. in, in no. the chapters that we're reading this week. And that's not to say that I'm bored, that I'm underwhelmed, that I haven't been entertained, or that you should skip these chapters. These chapters a fantastic. The tension carries through so well, even though most of it is just, uh, like, just picking through it with a set of, like, needle nose pliers. That's, that's, I mean, I've looked through my notes, and my notes are mostly about, you know, what, 
elements of the mystery that Keiguro Hinoshino has been trying to highlight. You know, there's a lot of discussion of the burnt fingerprints and the stolen bike and like, why is this piece of information here? Da, 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 da. And I mean, it does uh, set up really well this idea that both Galileo and Ishigami are like these omnipotent chess masters, which I really enjoy. Mm-hmm. But but that's it, right? The the drama and the tension of this story doesn't really come from the actions on screen. I, I said last week that I thought that, you know, there was going to be a big action, like forward motion in the second act that like... The, the daughter, Misato, is going to get kidnapped. Uh, but we spend more time looking at this this side uh, sort of story. It's, it's not like this big action set piece like I was kind of expecting with uh, with, with Kudo, who has begun to, to date her, uh, Yasuko. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't deserve laughter there. But anyway. No, no, <laughs> but anyway. Uh, so Kudo has kind of become a more significant character. We've watched Ishigami tail him and da, 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 but nothing has really happened there. I was half expecting for the climax of that scene to be Ishigami, you know, murdering the man. Like that's like the, the, you know, the second act sort of twist. Um, but none of that happens. None of these things happen. Yeah. I think one of the really fascinating things for me is that I started to realize that the tension actually comes from information being withheld from you because even though you understand why the tension is there and it's been very well built up that Ishigami is doing all of this because of his infatuation the curious thing is that we actually don't really know what he's going to do about it yes the threat of this is that he is such an unpredictable element in that all we know is that he is going to do the most logical uh beautiful mathematically perfect thing but there's kind of this ambiguity as to what that is because it's such an open-ended problem. It makes the scenes of the dates with Kudo just so much more threatening than they would otherwise be, and it's beautiful. I will say this is one of the more nuanced, I normally don't compliment this character, but the bumbling police detective, you know, I love the bumbling police detective, but he's never, he's never my favorite character. Um, But in this instance, Kusanagi is played very well in that he's still a competent person. He just doesn't have the best approach. Um, his approach to try and deal with suspects when he goes to, uh, to speak with Kudo, actually, you know, he says, this is a moment that, that I always hate when I have to be like very, uh, very upfront and grilly with the suspect. Like I know it'll get results, but it's going to cause, you know, drama and frustration from them. That sucks, but it's part of the job. And he tries the same thing on Ishigami and it doesn't really work or it it seems not to work. That's a, a whole other discussion. Um, but Galileo obviously is very sly and very personable, um, and very intimidating, obviously, but he still gets results in a more roundabout way. And so seeing the dynamic between the policeman uh, and the and the detective in this in this novel, I think is actually like really interesting. I, I love the way that uh, Kusanaki is handled um, as a, a character who's going to get everything wrong, but we still respect him and we still respect his ability. The one thing that I'm kind of curious in that herds is that I had a particular concern when I was going through this stretch of the story where I felt like a lot of the character details that we were setting up for Kusanagi couldn't pay off in a way. It almost felt like this is going to be like the one floor of this being the middle entry in a series, because you're right, we're setting up Kusanagi as this very competent detective, but when we have all of these mind games going on between Ishigami and Yukawa, the character development of Kusanagi feels very secondary, and also just the occasional appearances of Kishitani, his... Um, understudy effectively uh you know it, it doesn't feel like it's leading anywhere and i was wondering if you think differently than i did when i was going through this stretch of the story i don't know i i'm not really concerned about it mostly because i i think of him as a secondary character more than a main character you know between our cat and mouse game here i i suppose you're right in that it's you know it's it's part of a series i wouldn't expect him to suddenly turn around and have a big revelatory moments. Um, I expect that what's more likely to happen is that, because we, we ended on chapter 14 where Galileo has seemingly figured out everything because that's what detectives do. Of course, naturally. He like walks away from Kusanagi, like doesn't tell him like what he's uncovered. So what's probably going to happen is that Kusanagi is going to like come to the wrong conclusion. The d- detective is going to have to like set him right or like decide how to handle that situation. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not entirely certain how that's going to play out, but mm-hmm. I I expect that Kusanagi's not going to like be on the same level as as Galileo. Um, but hey, maybe in a future book they'll like 
team up for reals this time. Maybe that'll be what's hap- what happens. Also, on that note, I do have a mild complaint uh, with this story, and that's the fact that they gave Yukawa the nickname Detective Galileo when so many characters in the story keep referring to Kusanagi as the detective because it is his job as the detective. It's his title. So there's so many moments, both in reading and discussing this book, that I'm like, wait, hold on, is this which detective? Which one? <laughs> I Look, let's be clear. Whenever we read a novel like this, I... I'm bad with names at the best of times. This is just a problem that I have. Uh, long-time listeners will be aware of my inability to get names straight. So I tend to call characters by their their tropes. I'll say, oh yeah, they're like the Genki girl or like the love interest or the detective because I, I just cannot, I cannot remember names for the life of me. It's why I usually write big lists of names if I'm really struggling. But yeah, no, I think of Kusanagi as the policeman and and Galileo is the detective, and that's just how it is. I believe in the original text that uh, Detective Galileo is actually written with different characters to Detective Fukusanagi. I would say so, yeah. But I, I, I'm not sure if that's the case for all of the novels or if it was just from the particular sample that I saw when I was reading it, uh, and also both because I can't read Japanese at all. Yeah, I, I would assume just based on that, I also, like, I can't read Japanese, but I do have some knowledge of, of like, characters and how they work. Yeah. Um, I would assume that you wouldn't change them between novels because the characters that you actually use to, like, to write a name has so much meaning to it. Um, it is one of those things that I, I wish English had. Um, there is a, a level of poetry to um, to naming characters and to describing situations in Japanese because you could call two people the same name but use the characters for light and dark, for just as a random example, and have completely different connotations, right? Like, their names might sound similar, but there might be a moment when one of the characters says, oh, your name is written like this. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that even some, like murder mystery writers, they'll add, um, you know, they'll modify characters and have the modification, like the extra line be like, this is supposed to represent horns when you add it to this character. It's very weird. I don't fully understand it. And it's a concept that as an English reader, I can't fully appreciate, but I I love it as a thing. I love that it exists. I mean, as always, when we're dealing with other languages and other cultures, and particularly with translated works, it's just one of the struggles and we'll run into it again and again. For sure. But on the other hand, I did want to talk about the translation in this segment because, first sure. of all, I found the first typo of the of the <gasps> translation that I noticed oh, I in this it. section. What was it? it was just a small grammatical error. It actually <laughs> still kind of made sense. It was just that there was a V in a sentence where I didn't think it needed to be. Okay. Um, but the other thing that I really wanted to compliment, and we said this last week, the translation's been great so far, but I've read some criticism saying that reading this book felt like it was reading a translated text, which, okay... I mean, that's a true statement. <laughs> I guess that's that's criticism that I can understand but don't necessarily agree with. However, I think that the criticism that I saw was because it was about one of the mathematics scenes between Yukawa and Ishigami. Because I think that the way that the text tonally changes between the rest of the novel and the scenes where Ishigami and Yukawa are facing off actually really helps... And it's been carried across kind of effectively. There's something almost intentionally a bit more stilted about the discussions of theories in this book that really helps uh, separate it from the rest of the story. I think it highlights those scenes really well. And you feel like the air feels, you could feel that like stagnant air as it's like a, you know, a moment a pregnant moment where something's about to happen, something is about to be uncovered. I think it really does like lend to the to the narrative in that sense. Because the the reason I noticed it is because there's one scene where Kusanagi starts discussing mathematics with Ishigami, you know, for for other reasons in quotations. But you can just immediately see that transition from Kusanagi's normal dialogue into the slightly more stilted uh, mathematical moment. And there's also another uh, another short segment where Ish- uh, Ishigami asks his students to stop doing their maths exam and just write what they're thinking. And just the feel of the text changes in the most el- like just elegant way. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that that was, I, I think, carried across from the Japanese so effectively. Yeah, for sure. Anyhow, Herds, I think that's just about the time we have. So let's uh, throw to the tunes, throw to Paul Meter. I love who's tunes. Been guiding us through uh, all of Death of the Reader with his wonderful theme song he made for us. Yeah, the true hero. We'll be back with more of The Devotion of Suspect X by Keigo Higashino in just a second.
This is Flex and Herds here on Death of the Reader discussing The Devotion of Suspect X by Keigo Higashino, chapters 8 to 14. We're in the thick of it, and Herds, yeah. this is your last chance Ugh. to throw down your solution for this story, which honestly, Herds, I do have to be honest with you. I said last week uh-huh. yeah. that I was going to give you two points for just the mystery because it was a. I, I would have to lead the witness okay. to do otherwise. Okay. Are you about so to there are definitely. That? What's no, no, it's just we, before we get into you throwing your solutions on the floor, we need to understand that it's more than the uh, the who, the how, and the why that are going to be guiding your solution in this case. I think that uh, particularly given where we've ended this in this final scene of Yukawa supposedly realizing what's going on, maybe there's a little, uh, little extra detail you need to fish around for here. Okay. Herds. I'm glad that I have no idea what that is or how to find it. I know, I know. I'm Listen, ready. Herds, this is, uh, this is why I've had to offer two points for one problem. Okay. Because I don't want to lead the witness. All right, um, I'm ready. But I, I, think, I, think, I think you're prepared. I think you are emotionally I, capable. I hope so. Of I, coming to the right conclusion. Look, I have faith in me. I have faith in my ability to look past all of the excellent character dialogue and, and really grill into this and really look at it with a, a heartless... C- condemnational attitude that, that'll be that'll help me i'm sure the one thing i did want to address in the mystery herds is that this sequence as we said doesn't really do much and part of the reason it feels like it doesn't do much is because we spend so much time going over clues that we already know why they're there and who did them you know we know that the bike was put there by ishigami we know that the clothes were burned by ishigami probably so that he could wander around in the clothes of uh, Tagashi so that he could establish, you know, his position elsewhere during the day. That's kind of just on the table and it has been for us the entire time. So Galileo and Kusanagi going around and looking at all of these clues is really weird as a reader because what's the point? Like, why are we looking at things we already know as the audience if there isn't something more to discern? I mean, I think that, the solution here, and this is me, like, I've, I've gone over this story a couple times now because there's a lot of details that obviously the story does linger on. Um, I think that the the telling moments for me, there was the discussion of the bike being stolen, um, and specifically they highlighted that it was a, a new bike, that it was more likely to be reported. And the characters in the moment, they come up with the idea that that would somehow help the, the murderers, like get away with it, but I'm not sure that that's the case. And the reason why um, is is two things. One, the statement that Ishigami always is going to look for the most logical, straightforward solution. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, spoiler alert, on the show, often when when we're trying to determine who the culprit is at the end of the story, there is a very uh, a very clear decision that we that we have to make uh, between two suspects. And I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, the other, the other point was that at the end of chapter 14, when Galileo determines the solution, he like, he has an emotional moment. He, he like breaks down. He walks out the room. He's like, Kusanagi, I need a minute. I think that the solution to this story does not rely, uh, on trying to be- because, the whole story is about alibi, right? It's about time. It's about alibi. It's about establishing that, you know, that, that Yasuko could not possibly have killed Turkishi at the time that he was killed. And so I think that the solution here uh, is that uh, Ishigami is putting himself into the position of the killer. I think that that's like the play here. And in the conversation with Kusanagi, he thinks to himself, I need to be very careful about how I answer these questions. And frankly, he sounds sus as heck, the way that he answers those questions. So I think that his, like, cut-to-the-bone solution is, rather than trying to supply Yasuko with an ironclad alibi, is to make it so that he is the killer. And uh, the other detail that the story focuses in on, this is a part that I'm, I'm not 100% sorted on. I haven't been able to figure out the timeline exactly, but we talk a lot about how the fingerprints have been burnt and the body is like unrecognizable and the clothes have been changed around all this stuff. I don't think that's Togashi. I think that the body that they are actually examining for the time of death uh, is uh, somebody else. 
that Ishigami went and killed the following day. You know, he, he they're like, where were you the following day? Why did you call in sick? And he's like, I don't know. I wasn't anywhere. I think that um, you mentioned, actually, Flex, last time we were on the show, that Can Man is listed as, like, a real character in the story. I think that because Can Man, I know, I, you're loving this. I'm bringing it back to Can Man. I think that Can Man has been elicited as being, like, alive and present since then, but I think that he's a real actual character, either because he is the person who's been killed the day after, or it's one of his friends who's going to, like, give a testimony uh, during the, like, finale of the story. So if you were to go back to the first chapter and look down the list of homeless people that it describes, do you think you could then go back and find another scene where just one yes. of them is missing yes, in this I book? Do. Is that something that you have done? I, I haven't actually done it. I ran out of time. Oh, herds. I, I remember distinctly that the first time through, we get Can Man, like the engineer and some other character, and I don't think, I think it's that other character that isn't mentioned uh, when we go back to that location. So I think that what Ishigami has done is that he's literally gone to the homeless people, he's killed one of them, like dressed them up in Togashi's clothes or whatever, and uh, he's made it look as though Togashi was killed the following day so that Ishigami could be like, oh no, you got me. I am the only murderer. And this follows on thematically too, because the discussion that we first have immediately after the murder was was done is a discussion between Masato and Yasuko, who both are complicit in the murder, right? Um, and they say, I'm going to take the fall. No, I'm going to take the fall. And Ishigami's like, no, don't worry about it. I can get both of you off the hook. And the implicit solution being that he's the one who's going to take the fall. Now, I do want to address before you try to bamboozle me again. Uh, why is your solution changed so much from last time? You said he was going to be a horrible person who was going to kidnap everybody and all that crap. Here's the thing. My perception of his character has changed because uh, I, I do think he's callous enough to commit a murder. I think he would go that far. But he did not jealously kill Kudo. Um, and in fact, there was... This is another one of those details that's going to elude me, but the, the detectives discuss that the murder seemed to be pointing them towards a certain district of, 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 of the city. Um, and that district is where Kudo like lives. So I think that part of Ishigami's reason for saying you need to stop seeing Kudo is because he's worried that that like that false lead there will actually make them suspect her more. Interesting. Interesting. Herds, listen, hold on, hold on. Yes. I just have one question about all of this. I'm scared. What's the question? Are you still saying that the reason Togashi showed up in the first place was because of Ishigami, because that was something you suggested last week. I don't week, think and so. nothing you've no, said so no. far has explicitly excluded I'm, that. I'm going to Why has your opinion changed on it? Because I don't think that he would put Yasuko through that torment. Um, based on his moment of empathy uh, with the mass students, where he finally says, it was fine, just write whatever you want. We can see from that moment that he is, like, not a completely heartless person, I don't think that he would willingly put Yasuko into distress. And I also think that with his like chess master brain, like I don't see why he would say, well, obviously if I send her ex-husband to her, she'll definitely kill him. Like, I don't think that he would believe that because that is a desperate moment reading back over it anyway. Then why get involved at all? Because he loves her. Why? I mean? I'm, I, but, the the thing I'm torn on here, Herds, and the thing I don't understand in your solution. Oh God! The the one thing that's tipping me here is that if he is devoted enough, the devotion of Suspect X, to have done all of this, but not so cold hearted and infatuated that he's going to do anything about Kudo, you're kind of sitting in this weird middle ground where it seems like he both has and doesn't have the same motivation, you know? And it doesn't feel to me like you're suggesting that he's changed his mind midway through the course of things, because it sounds to me like you're suggesting that it was the plan all along for him to take the fall. Yes, that's my that's my feeling. That's like his solution from the moment that Togoji's head hit the, hits the floor. My, my feeling is not that he wants to be with her, but rather that he, like just is devoted to her that he like i don't know that that's the part that i might not 100 so, so you're, you're suggesting that this is all a selfless thing that he's <sighs> done because he believes so passionately in the goodwill of yasko to begin with well 
this is this is the part that I'm kind of kind of stuck on. It doesn't like I'm. I feel like I'm missing some plot point here. It's probably something we're gonna like be revealed down the track. Um, but clearly, like like here's the thing. The thing that we know from the rest of the story is that Turkish's life sucks. We know that he's like in a dead end job with all these people that he hates, and his work isn't appreciated. And uh, my my suspicion is that he like doesn't see any purpose to his life. That's that's like the impression that I'm getting, and so he believes that Yasuko is like worthy of his own self sacrifice. So it's not like entirely selfless. The only thing that I can think of is that the detectives they made a big deal of like when uh, when you first met. Ishigami, was there something he noticed about you? It's like, maybe, like, she reminds him of, like, somebody that he knew. Interesting, interesting. Or maybe, I'm not sure. I'm not sure entirely. That That's the part that I'm kind of stuck on, I guess. But, like, I can clearly see that he's devoted to them based on something that happened there. Mm. I don't know, maybe she helped him, and now he's, like, repaying the favor. The, the other thing... Herds that I haven't quite understood mm. through all of your theory. And the first thing that I brought up was that the evidence is so clearly planted sure. to distract from what's actually going on. So why, from the writer's perspective, is Keigo Higashino spending so much time going back over that evidence again? Do you think that all of this evidence is pointing us towards what you're saying? Or is it set dressing to disguise the things that you're saying? Uh. I mean, all of the pieces of evidence are supposed to, like, deliver Kusanagi to condemn him, right? Like, in this this theory here. So, yeah, all of these different pieces of evidence are designed for them to be taken at face value. Um, I think that that's the conclusion that we're supposed to reach. Um, It's it's only Galileo who, like, has known Ishigami for so long um, that is able to, like, pierce through his plan and, like, see that this is you know, done to protect someone else. That's, like, the motivation behind the crime. That's something that Kusanagi doesn't fully, like, dig into, I guess. I, I, I'm i on board, Herds. I'm excited to see how this turns out for you next week. I'm down for it. I think you will thoroughly enjoy the tail end of this book. The the one thing yeah. I do want to get you to say, Herds, last minute Uh-oh. before we disappear off into the ether until next week with our final discussion. I'm terrified. On the what is it? Suspect What's this X. thing? For your fallback point, Uh-oh. should you narrowly miss out on victory? We've been discussing mathematical theories and pairing them with pieces of the crime. Can you name one of those mathematical theories that you think is the linchpin to why Ishigami is acting the way you suggest he is? What? What? <laughs> okay, if I had to pick one, like, theorem or, like, logical deduction that's in this story. I, I don't know if this is maths, but the the statement that kind of sticks out to me is Galileo's... I, I think he's saying to Kusanagi, or, or, I think, he's saying, uh, you know, he, he asks the question, is it more difficult to create an unsolvable problem or to solve it, I guess? Ah, and that, the, the P equals NP. That one. Yeah, that one, sure. I, I don't, like, fully know what you're trying to get me to fish for here or what you're looking for, but... I, I can see that that, you know, that mirrors the entire story here, that Ishigami has spent all this time, you know, creating uh, an unsolvable problem with a false answer, right? Like that's, you know, it comes back to how we how I usually end these stories when there's two culprits that I think are equally likely, which one do I pick? Um, I mean, you experienced it back during The Dwarf, which we will yes. never speak of again. But uh, this entire idea of, um, you know, is it easier for the murder mystery writer or Ishigami in this case to to try and devise something that cannot be penetrated or is it easier to solve? Um, I would personally say it's easy to solve, but, you know, whatever, this is me. Uh, but, you know, that's that's the fun part of murder mystery. And I, I guess that's I guess that's my answer. Like. All right, all right, Herds. I'm I'm interested. I'm surprised you didn't go with the four map problem. Oh, sorry, the four color problem. I don't know. I feel like uh, I feel like trying to divide up the barriers between all of the issues in this murder mystery is maybe where I would have drawn the I, line. I guess, pun intended. I, I don't know. I guess we'll find out. I guess we will, Herds. Thank you so much for joining us as we discuss the devotion of Suspect X by Keigo Higashino. This is Death of the Reader. We've been discussing chapters eight to fourteen. Next week is fifteen to the end of this story. And Herds is reckoning. I, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> we are Flex and Herds. You're listening to 2SER.